So I'm not but I think for the people who stayed, we lost a few. We should provide at least one question for the final. The There's two things I want to do. Uh, we, we never really got through looking at a couple of other systems for acquiring data that uh, you, will, you might well come up with. And so I'd like to at least open those up a little bit. And, and the other is just something that's really interesting. It just has to do with another aspect of electromagnetic induction that you probably I mean, you know about, but you don't really think about it within the context of the terms that we're doing and um, sort of the fundamental physics. So I think those two things are kind of interesting and make uh, fill up the rest of the day. So just to, just to refresh your memories, because we've been doing DC resistivity, but if we go back to inductive sources, then this was that EM31, had a little tr transmitter here, so it's just a little coil wire <clears throat> with current going through it and then there's a receiver out o o over here and we had brought it in and just sort of carry this thing around and then you could have it to, so that it's standing up a hip leg or it could go down onto the ground you could also turn it so that you have different uh, orientations so, so that's uh, that was one thing, and then we, you've seen this a number of times, so that's just your apparent conductivity uh, from the quadrature phase, and then your in-phase component. And this guy's basically a metal detector, so you see these blue spots in here, so that's telling you something about what's going on. And this is really apparent conductivity, and if you've got regions in here that are kind of uniformly resistive, and it's looking the same in you know, kind of both directions, uh, then you're pretty confident you've got a 1D Earth, and maybe you've got something interesting there. When we did the very first lecture, we took you on this uh, tour through Ireland, and there was one place that, uh, or there was one case history that we haven't got back to, and I just thought it'd be interesting to do that. So they were looking for sand and gravel quarries. So now, actually, gravel is, uh, is a commodity, right? And if you could find this, uh, you might actually uh, be able to make some money out of it. So these, the, the area is, is mountainous. It's got rolling hills and lakes, and it's basically glacial deposits. And the glacial deposits were what gave rise to the uh, to, to sand and, and gravel. There's a lot of material that is boggish, uh, sort of wet, uh, you know, so carbonate material, and that's very conductive. The gravel deposits, however, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're cobbles, they're stones, uh, and they're, they're resistant, so they have a low, low conductivity. Uh, the other physical properties that you might be interested in uh, is the seismic velocity. So the gravels are really unconsolidated, so you'd expect them to have a really low seismic velocity. So therefore, you can think like a couple of different surveys, something to do with electromagnetics or something to do with seismic. So let's concentrate on electromagnetics. And there's a few things that were done. Again, from a reconnaissance viewpoint, something like the EM31 is pretty easy to, uh, to acquire. You just basically go over this, this region with your EM31 instrument, you plot out the apparent conductivities. The resolution of this map is pretty bad, but you can still see there's red over here, right? So those are high conductivity areas. And then there's blues over here, which are uh, low conductivity regions. So this is, if you're looking for sand and gravel, <coughs> then this dark blue areas are, are what you're interested in. So that's great. That gives you kind of like a first order map of what might be there. And then you could use that map to say, no, I want to do a bit of a follow up here. And maybe I'll just take you know, a more a closer look at some of these regions in here. So that's what was done. That's what was done here. You, you pick up a, a couple of traverses that go through, through here and then do a different kind of survey. And what they did was a DC resistivity survey. 
So that's one of the things that makes this particular case history nice, because we did the EM31 inductive source, got some reconnaissance. Now you follow that up with something that you actually put electrodes in the ground, and we're going to do a 2D uh, DC resistivity, just the same as you had your quiz on. So when you do that, this is a cross section along one of these one of these lines. So it takes the DC resistivity data, you generate these pseudo sections, and then you take those and you invert them, just as you were in this uh, quiz, and you get a two-dimensional structure. You've got depth in this axis, horizontal locations on this axis. Again, the blue is resistive material, and the red is, is more conductive. So we notice these blue regions in here, which actually corresponds to the center part of these groups here. So now you've got two geophysical surveys. They kind of uh, provide information about where that sand and gravel deposit is, and they, they sort of confirm each other. So that would be, uh, that would be a really good uh, you know, type of survey. These other lines that are on here, actually that was the results from the seismic survey. These numbers are indicative of uh, seismic velocity in kilometers per second, and that's basically 300 meters per second up here and gets down to a couple of kilometers per second down here. So everything is kind of fitting together. Low, uh, low conductivity, low seismic velocity, and uh, that would give you a good indication about where you should go and you know, dig things up if you wanted to uh, find that uh, <clears throat> you know, those, uh, gravel deposits. So that was a uh, case that kind of tied in the stuff that we were doing. I mentioned that with the EM31, you could turn it on different angles. And the idea with that, all of these things always come down to the same thing. If I've got a loop that's sitting like this, then I've got a magnetic field that's going like that. If I make my loop you know, in this direction, now I've got a magnetic field that goes like this. These two sources excite the Earth in a different way, and if we did the uh, the sensitivity function for this, remember it kind of goes up and down like this, where this was sort of a normalized uh, depth, and there was a particular depth at which we were most sensitive, but you're actually, we're not sensitive to stuff that was right at the surface. This thing goes to zero. So it's a maximum, I forgot this was, but it's sort of like uh, Z is equal to 0 0.4 or something like that, where that normalized depth is a true depth uh, scaled by the distance between the transmitter and receiver. So that's what that sensitivity function looked like. When you turn this guy on its side, the sensitivity function looks like that. So now it's actually most sensitive to what's happening <laughs> right at the surface. So that's good. So you can see, like, okay, maybe there's just by taking the instrument, having it one way, and then tilting it, I'm going to get a different image out of what the Earth is is like. Each of these data are going to provide more information. So that's the transmitter part of it. The other part of it is the receiver. So if I if I'm sitting here with a transmitter, and if I have a receiver that's oriented in this particular direction, then I'm going to get a, a certain signal. If I orient it in a different direction, I'm going to get a different signal. Each of those might tell you a little bit, slightly different information about what is, is really happening. And so the idea is that maybe you could go ahead and collect you know, a number of different kinds of these data, and then get you know, gradually build up more and more information about what's there. The other thing that you have at your disposal is the frequency. Because remember, the, the important thing about the frequency was that there was this skin depth. 
<clears throat> skin depth in meters, 500 times the resistivity divided by the frequency. So the higher the frequency, the smaller the skin depth. Or equivalently, if you go lower, then you're going to be able to see deeper. So you could imagine a system, again, the images here are pretty bad, but I'm not sure if you can see this. So there's a, there's a red coil here. This is, this is called an EM34. This is, again, something that uh, your geotechnical environmental groups would be, would, would be using. It's got the following thing. So it's, it's got a coil that's completely arbitrary. So you could, you could do whatever you wanted with this coil. You could have it like this, or you could turn it however you want. And it's got a receiver, which is another coil that's sitting back here. And again, you could do whatever you want with this. So you could separate them by different distances. You could turn them in different orientations. They could be flat. They could be uh, vertical like that. And each time you do something, time you make a measurement, then you're getting you know, a bit of different information out about what's there. And you can imagine that eventually you'd be able to pull all that stuff together and you know, get a good idea about what the conductivity is uh, beneath the surface. There's kind of particular tuning distances that are, are, are good in this case. If you had a 6.4 kilohertz, then maybe you might want to be 10 meters apart. If you go smaller frequencies, then you might want to go farther apart. So you can gradually see how you could build, build things up. So this is often used for uh, groundwater, uh, mapping contaminates, and sometimes for just groundwater well, exploration for looking deeper. So that's an EM34, and okay. then you have other guys too. This is uh, another frequency domain system. Uh, it's called a GEM system, and there's this is more like the well, it's kind of like your metal detector that you go along uh, on the beach with. So there's a there's a transmitting coil in here, and there's also a receiving coil, and it's operating at a particular frequency, and you can go over an area, and you could get a map out that looks something like this. In this case, he's looking for unexploded ordnance, and you get signals coming up like here that uh, first order kind of are reminiscent of what we saw with uh, magnetics and, uh, yeah, looking at, at the dipoles. So here's uh, another frequency domain system. Uh, this one is actually, you're going to fly this one in, in the air. And it's, it's something called Resolve. It's, so it's, you can kind of get a scale. So there's, what, 10 people across here? And this thing is called a bird. And inside the bird, there's this schematic that, that looks like this. We've got horizontal, we've got pairs of coils. We've got a transmitter, and we've got a receiver. And these things are kind of matched, so you've got... This transmitter goes with this receiver, dot, dot, dot. And we've got some that are coplanar. And then we've got two that are vertical. They're sort of co coaxial. So again, they will operate at different frequencies. You know, <laughs> 400, 6400, 100 kilohertz. Uh, different frequencies see deeper. So the idea is that you collect enough of this data and you can uh, kind of get a, a probing of what the uh, near surface of, of the Earth is. So this is what it looks like. You're going to haul it out and put it on the top of your truck. And uh, when you fly it, there's your helicopter and here's the bird. And then they just fly this thing back and forth. Uh, airborne acquisition is very efficient. It's costly with respect to you know the helicopter and stuff like that, but really, <laughs> you can acquire a large amount of data very quickly, and uh, that's one of the reasons that the, these things are so popular. Uh, there's a whole other suite of data that we did not talk about, uh, and that's called time domain electromagnetic data. And the only difference between time domain and frequency domain is in the, the, the transmitter. So in the frequency domain system, we're always thinking about putting on you know, some kind of harmonic signal that looks like that. In time domain systems, 
the current source is often it, it turns on and keeps on for a while and then it it shuts off it's kind of like what we're doing in DC resistivity but when we're working with electromagnetic induction we're operating at very uh, early times after that shutoff, and we can we can often get some kind of signature that's not related to the IP, but is actually related to the electrical conductivity. So that is probably two lectures, all in itself, and it would do more harm than good to go into that. But I do want you at least to know that when somebody talks about electromagnetic systems the systems that they're working with are either in frequency or sometimes they're called time, the other ones are called time domain systems. And the basic principles are the same, but there's some details that change just because of the nature of the, of the input rate. Now, the last thing I wanted to, to talk about is just kind of interesting but it's also quite relevant. Uh, did I ask how many people have seen Northern Lights or Southern Lights? Oh, sort of half. And uh, for, for those who did, what, uh, what kind of displays did you see as far as colors or waves or any, any description? Green. <laughs> so green, yeah. And where, where did you see them? Um, in the middle Ah, okay. As far up north. Who, who else has seen them? Where did you see them? I saw a bit of green purple up um, by Kilim, Manitoba, near Churchill. Okay, yeah. So these are all, these are all northern latitudes. And the understanding of why you see them at northern latitudes and you don't see them down here uh, actually has to come back with the Earth's magnetic field as, as well as how that Earth's magnetic field interacts with all of the particles that are, are coming from the sun. So this is, this is a good schematic. So we got the sun, it's not to scale of course. So we got the sun out here and there's always these solar flares and eruptions and solar storms that occur on the sun. And basically what that does, it just spews out a whole host of charged particles. You've got electrons and protons that are just sort of blasting out. Those particles come into the Earth's uh, magnetosphere and they interact with this. And in the important and perhaps the most important thing about the Earth having a magnetic field is that this magnetic field actually shields us from all these particles that come in. Without a magnetic field, there would not be any life here. So you can thank the fact that you're here to the existence of, of the Earth's magnetic field because what that does, these high energy particles that, that come in, instead of just sort of blasting through, kind of get deflected uh, de deflected around, and so you could kind of think about uh, us having a little bit of a, it's kind of like an umbrella around that just sort of protects us from all, all, all this stuff. And if you look at the magnetic field lines, you know, we were, when we were drawing the magnetic field lines of, of the Earth, you know, we'd always sort of sketch things out, you know, that looks like this, right? And, and that is, in fact, what it, things look like when you're really close to the close to the surface. But if you go farther away, then you suddenly find like, oh, things are really changed. And if you look at this picture here, you can see how that magnetic field is kind of blown back this way and kind of blown out this way. In fact, there is what's called a magneto tail that comes out here. This magnetic field comes way there. So that's the static situation of the Earth's magnetic field and, and how, it's, uh, how it's protecting us. Despite the fact that this is actually acting as a shield, there are ways in which particles uh, can 
sort of sneak through. They kind of go in through the back end here and with field line reconnection, they kind of come back out this way. And as they come in, we have a, have a charged particle. If you remember from first year physics, if you had a, if you had a particle that was moving at a particular velocity and it was through a magnetic field, as some Q, there was a force on it that depended upon the cross product of the velocity and the magnetic field. What that means is that as these particles come through and they're interacting with the field, that they, uh, there's a force that's acting on them that kind of controls how they, uh, how they move through here and they end up spiraling down these magnetic field lines so that the particles come in, they sort of spiral down, and then there's a region up at about 110 kilometers called the ionosphere. Uh, in which these particles actually move kind of horizontally across the, uh, you know, at that uh, ionospheric level. So the particles come down, move across, and then they can go back up. Ah. Now, in doing this, we can imagine that we've got a lot of particles that are moving around here. Well, charged particle, that's a current, right? So now we've got all these currents that that are flowing around here, and that is going to give rise to uh, magnetic fields. Time we have a current, we have a, have a magnetic field. This region where the currents are, are trapped uh, are called the, the polar cap, and there's a couple of main regions of currents called electrojets. There's an eastward electrojet and a westward electrojet. And all of this stuff is what is contributing to the you know, northern lights or, or, or southern lights. So, I mean, do you, do you know why, why we actually see anything? Why do we see particular color? Origin of northern lights or any of these? What ha what's happening? Anybody? Because they get excited and they get a certain frequency of energy. Yeah, that's, that's close. So if we've got an atom, okay, and then around that atom, so we got positive charges and neutrons in here. Around that atom, we got you know some electrons, right? Remember, there's these shells. You know, first one has two, next we've got eight. And the, the point about these shells is they, they're at different energy states. So if I have an incoming particle that comes in, so now I've got this proton or electron that's coming in, interacts with this guy, and if he knocks them out into an outer shell, so there's some energy that's gone from my proton to knock this guy out. Okay, that's good. But when he decays back, which he will, goes back here, and then there's a photon that's given off, and the photon is gives rise to you know, it's, it's color of a particular wavelength. So depending upon what the energy band difference is here, I'm going to see either a yellow or a red or a blue, right? So how's this all working? So we've got particles that are coming in. We're kind of protected by our magnetosphere. Still stuff comes in. It's going through some regions in here through the, through the electrojets. Those particles are hitting nitrogen atoms, oxygen atoms up there exciting them, when those decay back, I get a color of light. So where is this uh, auroral oval? It changes uh, when there's a big storm. Here's a, here's a couple of pictures um, as a function of time of a big storm that occurred a number of, of years ago. And it, the color intensity here shows the magnitude of the of, of the currents that are going on. So you can see a couple of things. One is that the currents are increasing, and secondly, they're moving a bit southward. So that's just a kind of a bit of a blown up picture. And then this is what the uh, resultant uh, visual image would look like with these uh, aurora. And if you, for those people who haven't had a chance to see it, it's, it's something you've got to do once in your lifetime because. They're just quite remarkable. You're just sitting there and you've just got these sheets of shimmering light that are coming in. And you just kind of imagine all these particles that are coming down and just 
creating all this stuff. It's, it, it is quite magical. The thing I wanted to show you was the following. <clears throat> this record that we've got here, they have uh, three component magnetometers measure kind of x, y, and, and a z as a function of time. So we've got time along here. And these are days. And as we, and this axis is in nanoteslas. So we've got, you know, a couple hundred nanoteslas through here. And you could watch any of these curves. And then all of a sudden you see something happen and things start to, to, to fluctuate. And we get large changes in that field. Here's a blown up of that. You get, if you just look at, let's say, the green curve here. So it's green, and then it goes whomp down here. Da, da, da. So this is the magnetic field with time. So when I'm sitting up here, you know, and 30 seconds later I'm down here, that's telling me that the magnetic field is changing a lot. Okay, so what is the first thing you think about when somebody tells you, oh, the magnetic field is changing? Anybody? Oh, I've got to do this one. Come on. What? Yeah, exactly. I've got a magnetic field. I've got a time-varying magnetic field, right? So that means it's got to be generating currents in any kind of a, uh, of, of a conductor. So we can actually use that. As, this is actually great information to use to penetrate to find the uh, conductivity way down deep inside the Earth. In fact, I did my master's degree on that a few years ago. Uh, but the other thing it can do is the following. We have our whole power system is grids, right? So. What do we do? We've got these electrical substations, and we have grids, you know, that go along like this, right? And that's just a wire that's sitting up there. So now you can imagine you've got all these, you know, got these towers, right? But they're all strung up with wires. And now if we took that and we put in some <coughs> time-varying magnetic field, okay? So then. Remember, I've got my flux, which was the integral over the, the area, times b dot n hat dA. So in that case, this might just be the integral over the area of the bz component. So whatever vertical component I've got. And that gives rise, that changing field, gives rise to a voltage. So my time rate of change of this flux gives rise to a voltage. So if you go back here, so at one point the magnetic field is like this, right? And just a short time later, it's like this. So there's a huge change in that magnetic flux, which means that there's got to be a voltage that's induced in this current or in this wire. And if I put a voltage in that wire, I'm going to make a current. And if I've got a current on there that I'm not expecting, you know, for these big power companies, I could blow a transformer. And that is exactly what happened. So there was a major blackout in New York. Your parents would know about this. You might not. There was uh, the whole eastern seaboard was completely blacked out from, from power for a couple of days. And the reason for this was just these great big power grids. And they get this voltage that goes in. So you start to get these you know, extra voltages and, and currents that come in. And they do have mechanisms. They try to, sh they try to shut things off, right? And they've got you know transformers that are you know things are grounded and they try to prevent current from going. But you can get a you can get a power surge that comes through here and that goes around that whole circuit much faster than you can switch anything off. And it does, you know, then those transformers they just blow up like firecrackers. 
And that's exactly what happened. It just went around. It just blew everything up. So the, the, the point about this was that we actually induced, uh, maybe these numbers aren't so important, uh, but we induced these extra voltages and currents that just cause things to, to go up. So this is, this is an entirely different application, if you like, but the physics is exactly the same, which is what I think is kind of interesting here. So you, you know something about the basic physics, and you know, with that, you're able to understand you know, not only somebody you know, going along trying to find a wire in the ground, but you can also understand, like, OK, here's the fundamental cause of uh, a big uh, electrical brownout in eastern Canada. OK, so I, that was just something I thought you might be interested in. I wanted to show you that. And uh, yeah, so what we're going to do then uh, for, for the TBL on Wednesday, you basically write your own questions. So in each section, take a question, take an answer, and then we're going to composite those. You'll get into your teams, and you'll try to choose the best ones for your teams. And then we're going to look at those and uh, put a couple of them on the final set. And then Friday? Friday.